I feel like this episode has to start out with like a yeehaw. <laughs> like yeehaw! <laughs> Rather than a howdy, y'all. You know, it's got to be a yeehaw on this one. Howdy, howdy, y'all. I'm Curtis Sunset. And I'm Leo Halston. And, and this is Weathery Rainbows. Rainbows. <laughs> well, howdy, howdy, Miss Halston. Let's go for a walk on the Rainbow Trail. Oh no, the last time you forgot the umbrellas and got us into a whole heap of trouble. I won't forget this time. Let's go! Uh... Oh my, those sirens! I feel stormy weather moving in! Girl, that ain't men it's raining. That's sequins and stones. each other to weather the rainbows on this episode we have a country music dj uh who's going to tell a lot about his story uh djing for one of the country music stations in Owensboro, kentucky uh that reaches out over about five states uh so uh but before we get into that i do want to do some updates uh, because we spent a lot of time in our last episode which was our first episode back in a while talking mm-hmm. about porn <laughs> so so let's do a little update. Leah, what's going on in your life? Well, hello, Holly there, y'all. It's been a <laughs> while. You know, I'm feeling my country roots. You know, I'm from Dallas, Texas, honey. Yeehaw! Yeehaw! <laughs> She's an original Dallas Cowboy cheerleader. Mm-hmm. Like a 19-something. Anyway, um, <laughs> what's new with me? Um, Let's see. Work. Um... Still doing paperwork with, uh, I completed my um, 30 hours of training for foster care. Um, Now I'm in the midst of paperwork, lots and lots of paperwork, Um, lots of home visits, uh, lots of interviews. So I'm doing that. Um, um, That's about it. Um, Just working a lot of stuff. Um, Got into my first car accident. Oh, goodness. Yes, so all the years that I've been driving, I've never had an accident, so I uh, wrecked my car. Oh. I'm o- I ended up okay, so my first accident, I did not get hurt. Um, I'm okay, but my car was totaled, So, but I have a whole new car now, and I'm loving it. And it's a, it's a super nice car, for the record. I've seen it. <laughs> it, is, <laughs> it is a very nice car, because I said, you know, I work really hard, and... Um, I just wanted to treat myself uh, and finally get something nice. So um, it was definitely time to meet for me to get rid of the 2010 Dodge Avenger. Rest in peace, Sterling. His name was Sterling. <laughs> uh, and uh, it was just, it was time for me to go ahead and lay him the rest. So, uh, but now I have Jabari. Jabari. Yes, Ooh. Jabari is black. Jabari Ooh. is a 2022 Kia K5. Tenant windows, nice rims. Yes, the doll treat herself. Sharp. Yeah. What I love the most is like you get this really nice hot car that I'm sure you could get a lot of trade in just by like showing them pictures and be like, look what I got. You want to go see it? But now you're going to get kids potentially. I <laughs> know. I know. In this car. So I hope you know it that. Was, it was a, a, a toss up between a SUV and this car. And Honestly, y'all, I wanted the SUV, but the SUV didn't. <laughs> the the SUV didn't have sunroof, and the most one of my most favorite things it didn't have the uh, automatic start button. It still had like the key turn, and I'm mm-hmm. like, uh, uh-uh, uh, honey, I'm spoiled with the just push <laughs> start. So, um, I think my kids will definitely uh, love it, and I'm gonna look like a cool ass badass rocking mom. <laughs> In this, in Jabari. I can hear it now. No food or drinks in the car. <laughs> oh, honey, there is no food or drinks in the car. I, like, <laughs> seriously, 
Um, the one thing about a black car is like, let me tell you, the pollen here in Kentucky yeah. is bad. So uh, when I first got my car, it was nice and clean. And a um, couple of days afterwards, I walked outside and I was like, where my car? And it was like green from all the pollen. It was crazy. And mind you, there's a, there's a tree in front of my house. So I, I was parking there because I wanted my car in front of my house. But also bird shit <laughs> from oh, that yeah. tree. <laughs> so it was wearing my new car out. So I was like, what the fuck, man? Like, no. So um, I'm parking like across the street. But like this car has so many features, you guys. I'm telling you. I went from a Dodge <laughs> Avenger with no features, no backup cam. I have backup cam now. I'm still turning Ooh. my head trying to look <laughs> back instead of use a backup cam. Um, I don't know how to use uh, my iPhone inside of my car to talk to people. Um, it just has so many cool features. Like, uh, it's automatic. So I can start my car from, like, inside the house and just, it's, I'm still learning stuff about it. So, um, but you know what? And all, I just wanted to treat myself. I worked so hard, you guys. I just wanted to, I just wanted to treat myself to something nice. That yeah. was my birthday gift super to nice. myself. Yeah. Super nice, yeah. Yep, you're I'll, 27 I'll be... right now, yes! I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. you, you were you were talking about backup cams, and I was just thinking, like, can you imagine a future when people get backup cams and like how you would use it? <laughs> so. Oh my god. <laughs> The, so my sales like <laughs> my sales lady made me feel so bad. She said uh, we were test driving something, and I said, "Does this have backup cam?" She said, "Sweetie," <laughs> she said, "Every car that was made after 2018 have backup cam." <laughs> yeah, it's like mandated now. You gotta have. <laughs> it's so hard uh. to use. Like when you're used to turning your neck, like I'm still using my neck, but I'm starting to get adjusted to the backup cam. It's yeah. it's accurate, like still, but I'm like, uh, um, um, and also like I'm just getting used to driving too because since it was my first accident, I'm so yeah. nervous to drive now. Like, uh, like every light, um, every stop sign I come to, I'm like so nervous. Um, you have to drive for yourself and the next person too. So, yeah, my um, first accident actually going. happened. Like my first accident happened whenever I was headed to Atlanta Pride. It was going to be my first Ooh. Atlanta Pride and it was raining and I skid like three car lengths into this other car and it was awful. And then I had to wait uh, and here I am funny. decked out in like pride gear and the cop comes and yeah, it just wasn't yeah. a pleasant experience. Traumatic. Well, honey, <laughs> I was leaving the show at three o'clock in the morning. I had oh. three at once. I was painted. <laughs> For the gods. I had this hair, wig on that I have on now. Uh, and I had a moo uh, on. And uh, these black guys jumped out the car. And they was like, ma'am, you okay? And I looked and they was like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> they were nice, like, though. Oh, my goodness. They Ooh. ended up being nice. I was so nervous. I was they they ended up being nice, though. It was crazy. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, no, that's what's been going on with me. Like nothing but just work, um, getting ready for all the events that's coming up and um, trying to stay alive and afloat, survive. Yeah. What about you? That's good. What's going on with Curtis? Whew, what is not going on with me? Mercury's been in retrograde, and like so, I've had these like really good moments and then awful moments. So it's just this, yeah. this back and forth. And uh, uh, I was really excited to see that uh, Tovlo is going to headline Kentucky Anna Pride, though. Like mm -hmm. I am thrilled. I know you. You were like, I don't even know who this is, and I'm like, uh, you're Shh. going to. You oh, are going that you to just know. call me out <laughs> on the podcast. I okay. Everybody you, from here on out needs to get you to listen to Tovlo because you are missing. Out. I when <laughs> you didn't tell me the song when I heard the yeah. song one song that I know I said oh I know who that is now. Yeah, I think her album like Queen of the Clouds is like my favorite <sighs> album. I'm almost gonna say of all time. Like I love yeah. that album. So I was I was stoked. That was like the happy moment uh, recently yeah. whenever they announced that. Uh, what else has been going on with me? Um, work, 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 obviously. Um, the law has uh, geared up so much since uh, kind of the end of COVID, which is a great thing. Like, I'm glad COVID's over. Um, yeah. But it does mean more work. Um, so yeah. I've been doing that, uh, dealing with all the tech difficulties and all the bullshit that we went through. Um, 
And then uh, getting ready for our one year anniversary. So I'm pretty Ooh. pumped about that. I'm so pumped um, about that. That deserves a love. Yeah. yeah, we have we will have been on the airs for one year uh, mm-hmm. as of June twelfth. Uh, so it's right around the corner. Um, and we are going to have something special on that day uh, mm-hmm. that will launch. So I'm pretty stoked about it. Yeah. Um, let's see. Derby was. We just had Derby. What do you think about yeah. Derby? Um, um <clears throat> let's see. <clears throat> um, I'm trying to remember Derby. <laughs> I, you know what? I, Me I don't even want to. I don't even want to talk about Derby because guess what? <laughs> Jenna Jackson was in town. Only a few feet away, a few feet away from me, and I could not see her. Oh. So I'm pissed. Yeah. I'm pissed that she was that close. And to find out that leaving the stadium, she was escorted. She drove past play with the police cars and her limousine. Oh. She drove past play, and she didn't even stop. Didn't even <laughs> stop, Shannon. Rude. Rude. I know. Um, oh, I uh, honestly, Derby was was good. I was just telling some friends, like, <clears throat> all the years that I've lived here, I've never been to the Derby. And, like, I just, I think it's amazing that people get dressed up for a minute, a minute yeah. race. But also, mm-hmm. I'm glad because, like, it's it got to be hard on those, like, I'm an animal lover. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm grateful that that race is a minute because, like, them horses, like, to put them through that, it's crazy. Oh yeah, and so much training beforehand. So I mean, yeah, it's, yeah there's been a there's been a lot to uh, consider about horse racing. Um, yeah, I just I mean I just enjoy that Kentucky has two weeks dedicated to one day that really only culminates into a two minute horse race. So yeah, because uh, it starts with Thunder over Louisville and then goes, yes. you know, so, and it was first year back for Thunder over Louisville. So that was, mm-hmm. you know, wild. And it was packed. It was the yeah. most, tur- it was the biggest turnout they've, they've had. If you wow. were in that area, your cell phone didn't work at all. Yeah. It was Which- crazy. And the weather was lovely. Um, you know, my favorite part about that those two weeks are the chow wagon because I like to eat. <laughs> of course, yes. And since this wagon. is a country episode, the yep. chow, the chow wagon. Honestly, I'm gonna tell you, I did not turn up and turn out at the chow wagon like I wanted to. I'm mm. pissed that I still have a gift card because you know I hosted the uh, festival uh, festival yeah. Louisville drag show mm-hmm. uh, on that Sunday. They gave us a credit card with. Uh, about twenty five dollars on it for food. I didn't get to use my credit card, you know. Um, I only got some tacos that day because I drank so much that day. I got so drunk, but you know what? I had a good time with that show. There was a lot, lot of kids out at that, and I love kids. And like yeah. just to see the kids come up and tip, tip yeah. the drag queens made my day. Um, there was one little girl in particular. She was dressed up like a unicorn in her rainbow. Aww. And um, I called her up and I made her walk the runway. Aww. And people started tipping her. And I was <laughs> like, you know what? Put that up and save it for college. You know, she tried to give <laughs> me the money. I was like, Aww. you save that for college. Yeah. Um, I gave every kid out there a hug while I was performing as many as I could. Like, yeah. it was crazy. That's such not a great to, event. Yeah. Not to mention that people were buying me um oh, tequila sunrises. I think that's the name of the drink. And I would they they so the first one I got, I chugged it just as a you know, just because it's me. Mm-hmm. So after I chugged the first one, and mind you the cup, it's a decent sized cup. After I chugged the first one, they thought it was cute to keep buying me tequila sunrises <laughs> and chugging them. Yeah. So I was pretty tore up. See, that, that's where, like, that's the difference between most people and me, because I would have bought you one of them big old corn dogs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, here, Leah, you need to eat. <laughs> need well, to eat. somebody did, they did, at at <laughs> one point, somebody did bring me over some chicken tenders. Yeah, that's It awesome. was the biggest chicken tender I ever seen in my life. I was like, is this a whole chicken? It was like it was big, uh, but it mm-hmm. was a great time. Um, also, um, um, I will be, uh, hosting, um, 
I'm we're, so Pride is doing something a little bit different. Normally, I'm on the main stage hosting. I will be mm-hmm. at under. I'll be hosting the drag show in the Rainbow Tent this year. So I'll be hosting from two p.m. to eight o'clock p.m. in the Ooh. Rainbow. Yes. Lordy, lordy, that's gonna be a long day. <laughs> it's gonna be a long day, and the parade is at twelve. Yep. And uh, we will have some people in the parade. And then uh, Weathering Rainbows will also we'll have a, a booth. Um, okay. So, and I know. So I'm going to have to make play. my way. I'm going to be. I'm going to have to be. You're going to be making your duty. May. Yeah, you're going to uh, be like walking everywhere that day. Yeah, I don't. I mean, you may not get to move from that stage, though, honestly. Oh, uh, no, I'm taking a break. <laughs> I'm taking a break. I'm yeah. taking a lunch break, honey. <clears throat> yeah. Well, the, the big things, the things we're really going to dance to are later in that night. So, yeah. you know, they got toe blow, so you better be there yeah. for that. <laughs> well, I can't because I have to go to work. You remember the, the act, those people, the headliners don't go on until like nine o'clock. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And I have to work at nine. So I'll just, I'll just live through your Snapchats. You better because <laughs> I will be twirling. <laughs> are you trying to meet her too? I'm sure you are. I, I've, I can't say that on the air. Uh, <laughs> I've already told you what I'm willing to do to meet Tovlo. Oh so. my God, I forgot. <laughs> yes, you did. Yeah. Yeehaw! Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big uh, Tovlo fan. I will do a lot to meet Tovlo. Anyway. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to learn one of her songs to do. I'm hoping she comes to the bar. Oh, I got I got some songs. Well, I'll give you some good ones. I'll, I'll pick you out a good one to do. Well, uh, yes. Like Em Young, I feel like is a great one. Uh, there's My Gun is another great one for you to listen to. Um, yeah. L- like I'm Young, they used to call- say that that was my theme song. So mm. they used to torment me with that. I think I may <laughs> like uh, My Gun. That would be great for me. You would love that one. That's like my favorite song to dance to secretly. <laughs> so, mm. so um, secretly in your house, you dance around. Oh, yeah. yeah. Is it like a risky business? Like just a shirt Sometimes. and underwear? Sometimes. <laughs> Honestly, most of the time, like, which I haven't been working out as much as I normally do, but I would say 90% of my workout is just like dancing in between sets. So, oh my God. Like, oh my God. So that's me. Uh, but Pride Month is coming up. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, yeah. Kentucky Anna Pride is going to be the uh, 18th. It's one uh, day this year. Yes. Yeah. I'm so excited that's about that. Unique. I, I think it's going to be a really good thing that it's only I mean, one day. Being a uh, performer here in uh, Drag Queen, working at one of the prestigious bars, like two days mm-hmm. of that is hard. You know, yeah. we start Friday, then we have to get up early Saturday morning. Yeah. So it's not, I, I don't think there's going to be any difference because we still have to work Friday night um, and still get up because the parade is at yeah. 12. So. Yeah. But it it uh we're not uh we're cutting back a lot of things place cutting back a lot of things that they normally would do so we have a look, we have an easier day mind you I've never had I've never sat at the boots or had to do the pictures because yeah. I've been on the main stage for years so yeah um it's gonna be crazy I'm excited yeah. is it, there a child wagon there too I mean they they have some food there. <laughs> There's a okay. lot of sausage there, girl. You can you can find your, you can find your feel. <laughs> I'm over sausage, honey. I need a turkey leg. <laughs> oh lordy! I'm looking for the whole turkey. <laughs> well, <laughs> wait a minute. You want to hear something funny? Uh oh. What's the funny? Do you know? Do you notice anything different about me? For the for people that can see, are you looking at me? Uh, am I, oh God, I'm so bad at these kind of things. <laughs> you, okay, see, Curtis is like my drag husband. He don't notice anything different that I got done. Oh God, what am I supposed to be noticing? <laughs> <laughs> so, no, no, it's nothing I've gotten done. You guys, I was rushing today getting ready for the podcast because we haven't <laughs> done it in a while. If you are watching this, I have a brown contact and a gray contact in. <laughs> I scream! I say it's too late to change them. There's a you can oh tell God, now. I can notice now. Yeah, you got your eyes open. Oh my goodness! Yep, yep. You definitely have two different. I thought color it eyes. was funny, which is I probably should start doing this. Like, it, I think it's cute. Yep. What's Leah my done signature. different today? 
difference. <laughs> like those uh, little little books you get as kids, like find the difference. Right. Uh, I would. I sucked at those. <laughs> so. yeah, I'm I'm very good at that. Actually, I still play those games. You know, you can get them as an app now. I I would not be good at them. I, and there's I, they, I was never there good are at erotic the ones too. Oh my goodness! Of course, you would have those. <laughs> Yeah, we're gonna pl- we're gonna have to play those games like on here one day because I've never seen an erotic uh, find the difference game. So. Oh, well, you never had you <clears throat> been the triangles when it was open. It, yeah. that's where I used to play it at triangles oh, on okay. that little uh, gaming thing. Okay, see, I don't mm-hmm. guess I ever uh, played the games at triangles. I was yeah. more interested in the the boys on the counter normally. Oh so. my god. <laughs> We we need a bar like we we we're missing that. Uh, Ooh, well, bar. Oh my god! Shout out to Big Bar yeah. for the new uh, add on. Yep, the Rainbow Room. It so. looks really nice. I like it. Yeah, we're gonna have to do like a on like a live one day at the Rainbow yeah. Room. I feel like that's oh, sh- that's something we should coordinate for sure. Oh, I'm sure Kevin would <laughs> let us, child. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was nice to see him again. Like I saw him at Derby yeah. uh, as well. It's nice to see him back and out and around. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, and and but Big Bar does have dancers now on back on I think Thursday oh, really? nights. Yeah, I think they've really? restarted that. So, okay. Because um, <clears throat> they were they had it and then COVID happened and then you know all that and then so I think they're back though. Yeah. Um, so I guess this is the episode where we should probably announce uh, some kind of big news. Okay. Um, like last year, we had Tate Hoskins come as our guest of mm-hmm. honor for Pride. Mm-hmm. Um, well, this year, it kind of wor- just worked out uh, because I don't know. I mean, people that probably watch the show remember, but I did win the My Gay Online Boyfriend. Yes. So, so That's I did not, big news. That was big. I Because you remember how scared I was to even enter it. <laughs> you <laughs> so. were, but your your videos were so good. Like I didn't have a doubt that you would not win. You were you were. It was good. It was it was a great time. Like I've I've met a lot of people through that, and like we've we've gained a lot of followers and friends and stuff through that as well. So I I'm very happy I did it. Um, and I think it's like. It's only inspired me to make a lot more like that kind of video content. So humorous yeah. video content. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think people are going to see some cool shit here soon. I love but it. the big news is, is actually for all of you all that would message me and be like, oh, Chris Stanley, he's such a cute twink. Oh, he's so cute. Are y'all really going to date? Blah, 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 blah. Well, he is coming to Kentucky Anna Pride. Uh, and he will be here uh, a little bit before that because we're going to do some film and, and some different things uh, in Louisville, Kentucky. Mm-hmm. So we're actually going to meet. Um, so oh, it's good. pretty exciting news. Um, and everybody will get to see his twink gloriousness running around pride. I don't know what he's going to wear, but, who you know, you might get to see something. <laughs> wow. So, so I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, he's coming this year. Uh, like I said, we're going to be on the parade, and we're going to have a booth this year. We didn't have a booth last year. Um, so come by and see us, um, yeah. and, and maybe we'll do some uh, intent interviews with just random people. Uh, I think oh, that would be, be nice. fun. So, and a pop-in by and me. A little pop-in by Lee on occasion, <laughs> walking through the crowd. <laughs> so. I started to take this year off from Pride, but there's no way I could. Yeah. You got to like pop in and ask like the most inappropriate questions though. Like I'll be interviewing them like about serious stuff and you'll be like, do you like rim jobs? Oh (laughs) my God. You know, and you know, I would. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I would. (laughs) So Uh, what's your favorite position? (laughs) People will love that. So, yeah. All right. Um, so this is a country episode. Uh, so Leah, what is your favorite country song or singer? That you My favorite to? country song is Any Man of Mine by Shania Twain. I love, of course. I mean, I love country music in general. I love Dolly. I love Reba, Fancy. And Fancy was my name. <laughs> I love uh, Reba. You know, I grew up, well, first of all, I used to work in a, um, uh, Lacage the Falls Country Review um, Celebrity Lookalike Show. So I worked with uh, a Dolly impersonator, a Reba impersonator, 
Um, and I did Tina Turner, of course. And did yeah. you know Tina have a country album? I did not know that. I have I, I have the country album. I mean, I personally don't like it, but she did a country <laughs> album. So I did I didn't do the country album in the show, but you know, I did Tina Turner in the show. But um of course I'm a Texas gal. I grew up liking country music, you know. I like uh Willie Nelson, you know. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love Carrie Underwood. I love there's just something about country that I just like the just the twang and the realness of it. So, yeah. like when I come out and do any man of mine on the show, the crowd look at me like, "What the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> what is she doing?" Why? <laughs> right. See, I would be. be all- I'd be all about it because, like, I am a like I love Shania Twain. That's another yeah. one of my like guilty pleasures. It yeah. goes for me. It's like Prince Tovlo Shania Twain. Honestly, yeah. like that's my like top three. So. I, I listen. I would do more country if I could. Like, I mean, I would wreck the kids. Like nine to five. I want to do not working nine to five. Yeah, mm-hmm. come on, y'all. I really want to do Fancy by Reba, but there's that one part where I don't think. For me, it would be appropriate mm. to do, you know, what she says in the song. I'm not going to go through all of that. But I lo- maybe I can get it edited out, you know. It's good. But I love fancy. Like, we just, for for this to be Kentucky, a lot of our, our queens here don't do enough country music. Yeah. Yeah. I like, um, there's a hole in the bottle. That's a good one to do. Mm. with. You could do a duet with that one. Mm. So. Maybe, maybe, which I'm not going to be in it. I've already told you, but Hunks and Pumps, maybe we can get some people to do a duet to that one. I think that'll be a good one. So, oh, I think I can convince you. We can do I'm it. Not, we can do I will, it. I will count we money backstage do, for you, or I will do all kinds of things, but I, I don't think, know if I, I can do the drag Reba thing. And, I think Reba and Beyonce did a duet, so maybe you could be Reba and I could be Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Okay. I've said this since we started filming that I want this summer, which I'm not going to have the body for it because I haven't been working out. But this summer, I want us to do a reenactment of Justin Bieber and Nicki Minaj where like they're at the pool, the uh, beauty and and the beat. That oh song. yeah i think we need to reenact that so i mean i'm down for it yeah <laughs> well i mean there's a lot of stuff we got to do we got to get ready for little mermaid mm-hmm. we Gosh. can do a skit with that you know so much I don't, stuff. I don't, yeah we've got a lot coming i i'm not gonna announce the big thing on this episode yeah. but the big one the big announcement for our show is coming next episode because it's gonna Yay. be in june it's gonna be pride month uh, it's almost our one-year anniversary, so the big, big announcement uh, of something we are going to be kicking off that I think everybody's even going to love, unfortunately, even more than this show, which is yes. sad because I love this show too, but too. Uh, but people are going to love it. So love it. be yes, ready for that. It. Be ready, be ready, be ready. Um, all right. Well, we're going to kick it over to the interview, but before I do... Uh, because I know she's just got them sitting there from a previous episode. I want you to pick your favorite toy, Leah, that you've got next to you. <laughs> oh, but you know what? I've already put them you back in my drawer. <laughs> yes, because I think I have a company tonight, honey. So, uh huh. All right. For the record, she, y'all. She, last episode, <laughs> she like she pulls out all these like toys, and she's like, "I was going to talk about them in the porn episode," and I was like, "Oh my god, Leah." Well, I guess we're going to have to have like a toy episode. Maybe I think I'll we sh- should. Maybe I'll show you what's in my box. Oh, and I'll show you what's in my box. Oh, we should have done that for William's episode, The Magic Box. Oh, God, (laughs) yes. Oh, well, missed opportunities. All right, on that note, we're going to kick it over to Chad Benefield, who is a uh, DJ. Uh, He's also the host of several different events here in Owensboro, Kentucky, uh, (laughs) that you will definitely see him out and about. So here is our interview with Chad. (laughs) Yeah! Howdy, howdy, y'all, and welcome back to the Weathering Rainbows interview portion, where we get to interview a lot of really cool individuals out there doing some amazing things for the LGBTQ plus community. Today, we have a treat, uh, someone who's going to sound a lot better on the mic than I do. Uh, we have Chad, <laughs> who is from uh, Owensboro, Kentucky, uh, right near my hometown, back in uh, Calhoun, Kentucky. Um, and Chad is the host of a morning talk show here in Owensboro of a country music station. So he has so many stories, but I'm going to kick it over to him to just kind of give us a little bit about himself. 
Curtis, thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Yeah. We're so excited. And I'm really, I'm jealous of your background because it looks (laughs) so festive and fun and I look like I'm in some sort of institution, but (laughs) that's okay. Um, Yeah. So uh, I'm Chad Benefield. I am uh, one half of the morning show on the country station, 92.5 WBKR in Owensboro. Uh, I have been on that show since 2004. Wow. <laughs> it's been a long time. Um, but I'm also, so I, in addition to my radio show duties, I'm also director of content for uh, Town Square, Evansville, and Owensboro. So I oversee two stations in Owensboro and five in Evansville. Wow. So that's my life. That's my job. So what was that? What is that like? Uh, you are the host of a, a country music station and you're a gay man. So that is something yes. that a lot of people would not uh, put those two things together a lot of times. So how, <laughs> how has that experience been for you? You know, it actually has been um, interesting. I, and and I, I hate to use the words openly gay. That just that just sounds like there's something you should be ashamed of. So I hate saying openly gay back to back. So I don't, I don't think of it that way. Uh, but it's no secret that I'm married to a man. Um, I talk about my husband on the air. Uh, I think it's my duty to do so. Um, and so I share a lot of my life on the air. I mean, and I think that because I do that, um, it's made me more relatable to our listeners. Um, it's not a surprise to them. If it is, they haven't been paying attention. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but but I do think, I mean, so much of what I think the radio host should be, um, I think they should be real human beings. Uh, and this particular real human being happens to have been with the same man for the last 23, 24 years. We've been married for five. Uh, that's a big part of my life. And I think that I would be doing myself a disservice uh, and the listening audience a disservice if I was trying to be something that I'm not. Um, so I, I make it a point. If something happens funny at home that involves Kevin, I mention Kevin's name on the air. I mean, they get that perspective. And trust me, with what I'm married to, funny things happen a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so I need to share those. Right. So did you did you like country music before you started at this station? Or has it grown on you? So I came to country music late. And full disclosure, I... Obviously, I grew up with it because if you're from Owensboro and you're from this region here in Western Kentucky, you know what country music is. You know who the artists are. But personally speaking, uh, I was a child of the 80s. So the 80s were my jam. I mean, bring on some Taylor Dane, some Millie Vanilli, some Jody Watley, some Rick Astley, some Michael Jackson. Some Janet Prince. Jackson, that was my jam. Some print. Oh, for sure. <laughs> well, hold on. So really <laughs> hilarious story. When I was a kid, uh, my stepfather was a classical musician. Alan Quinn, a lot of people in this community know who that is. Uh, he, he always played the, the pipe organ as Santa Claus rolled into town for the Christmas parade. parade. That was my stepdad. So we traveled around the state a lot because he played for beauty pageants. He played for horse shows and things like that. Well, I think it was at a beauty pageant in Louisville, probably the Kentucky State Fair pageant. Uh, it was around the same time that this huge flea market took place at uh, Free Freedom Hall, the convention center. So we went to this flea market and I swear to you, what I bought with my allowance was this ghastly poster of Prince yes. that had been <laughs> that had been glued onto this piece of maple wood. And like when they put the, the poster on the wood, it was still dripping. And so <laughs> It was so gross. I had this thing for like 10 years, this poster of prints that had like these maple tree drippings hanging yeah. off the side of it. It was one of my <laughs> most prized possessions of the 80s. But yes, prints. Love it. So um, when I moved back to Owensboro, I was never going to stay here. Um, but I was here for a couple of months, actually less than two, and I got hired at the radio station. Um, and right around that time, I discovered Mindy McCready. Um, she had just released a new album. Uh, of course, Mindy's no longer with us. Actually, a really sad country music story. She um, ended up um, committing suicide a few years back. Terrible story. But I fell in love with Mindy McCready. And the, furry, the very first CD country that I ever bought was Mindy McCready's. <laughs> so I came to country music late, but I love it now. Um, and uh, and obviously working on a country station. I mean, I sort of live and breathe country music. I write country music. Um, I'm, I'm a huge fan. 
That's great. So let's talk a little bit about that. You talked about uh, coming back to Onsboro. That is not something that a lot of us ever intended to do. Uh, and I don't think any of us ever intended to actually stay once we came back. So uh, tell us a little bit about your story coming back here. Yeah. So um, when I I went to Kentucky Wesleyan College for a couple of years, uh, I transferred to UofL. That's where I graduated from. Uh, within a month of graduating from UofL, I moved to California. Um, I was an aspiring screenwriter and I applied for a fellowship through Disney. And, and oddly enough, I wrote, a, I wrote an episode of Friends, uh, the sitcom, to apply for the Disney fellowship. Oh, wow. And Fresh out of college, um, had a creative writing emphasis uh, for my degree in English at U of L. Um, I arrogantly just assumed that I would get the fellowship, <laughs> so I moved to California. <laughs> Main character energy well, right there. <laughs> Going for it. Didn't get the fellowship, uh, but did start working for a theater company, uh, actually a Jewish theater company, oddly enough, and I'm not Jewish, uh, in San Diego. Um, and so I was there for a couple of years. And actually was um, had a long a long term relationship which ended, and when that relationship ended with my college uh, boyfriend Steve, um, I was like, okay, so do I stay in California? What do I see? Like, where, where am I going? And so I decided uh, to apply for a broadcast journalism graduate program at NYU. Uh, so I got in and I left San Diego to go to NYU, but stopped in Owensboro just to save some money and live with my parents for a couple of months before school started. Well, literally within six weeks of moving here, I got hired um, at the radio station uh, through an acquaintance, kind of a long story. Um, so I started working at the radio station within six weeks of being here. And uh, when it came time to roll around to go to school, I'm like, okay, gosh, like NYU is pretty expensive. Do I go off to school and spend $90,000 for three semesters doing what I'm basically doing on the job or do I stay? So I stayed. Um, a few months later, I thought, what are you doing? <laughs> you just trapped yourself in Owensboro. Right. What are you doing? <laughs> So I reapplied to NYU. I got in a second time. And by the time that it rolled around to go to school the second time, um, I had started my relationship with Kevin. Um, school, um, I was doing a lot more at work. And so I turned NYU down a second time. And that was 23 years ago. Wow. <laughs> you don't hear so a lot of people turning down NYU, too. That's an incredible school. So to the fact that you stayed in Owensboro... And you have now become a, an, a huge advocate for the LGBTQ community here. Yeah. Uh, I think you, se you self-imposed the name Norma Ray uh, of Owensboro. Uh, <laughs> that's what I read. Well, there's more to that. <laughs> so, it's, it's Norma Ray to the gays. To the gays. I'm, yeah. I'm the Norma Ray of the gays, yes. Yeah. So, and obviously, uh, Owensboro's had a very struggled history with uh, the fairness ordinances that we've tried to pass here and various things like that. Uh, tell us a little bit about... First, I want to know about your upbringing and your experience uh, kind of coming to terms with being a gay man um, and your experience there. And then we'll get into the fairness ordinance. OK, so, you know, and, and, and a lot of people listening will probably relate to this. Right. Because it is it is quite different. And I've traveled around a lot. I've lived various places. It is quite different growing up gay in a place like Western Kentucky yeah. that is relatively small town USA, even though once brought the time that I was growing up was the third largest city. We've been eclipsed by Bowling Green. We're now the fourth largest city. It does still have that very small town feel, but I knew that my attractions were to the same sex very early on in life. Uh, I think a lot of people relate to yeah. that. In fact, I'll tell you the story, even though it's it's kind of embarrassing and it's sort of a stereotype, <laughs> but I'll own it. So. The, the moment in my life when the, the bell sort of went off in my head and I connected the dots for myself, this is really embarrassing. That's great. <laughs> do, you know the, do you know the movie Midnight Express? I can't say that I do. <laughs> okay. That how, old are you, how old are you, Curtis? I'm 32. Should I know this movie? Okay. Mm, well, yeah, I actually have a copy. I'll loan it to okay, you. I'm going to watch this movie. Um, <laughs> Well, so in the movie, Brad Davis plays an American who goes to a Turkish prison. Okay, insert laugh track, right? So oddly enough, um, one of the network, uh, one of the networks 
pick that movie up to show on television. And there's a scene in that movie where Brad Davis, his character, has sort of fallen in love with the cellmate. I told you this was stereotypical. <laughs> um, but and, and I'll credit, I mean, credit network tele- television back in the late 70s, maybe the early 80s. But they showed this scene where Brad Davis and his his roommate nearly kiss in the steam room of the prison. Well, for me as a kid, like who was trying to connect the dots for himself, when I saw that scene, and I'll never forget this because my mom and my sister went, oh, gross. And I was like, not gross right. at all. Brad Davis is freaking hot. Like, this is it. And so it was really as, I mean, as, as funny as that scenario is. I mean, for me, that was how, like I, I then in that moment knew, oh, so this is why I had been feeling differently. I mean, and, and it's so funny that I actually still own a copy of that movie because that movie for me was the epiphany. I mean, it was Brad Davis in the steam room in the prison. But um, that's awesome. We all so have yeah, those I mean, movies. Mine was, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I was one of the hundred thousand plus that uh, it was Batman and Robin uh, when O'Connell played Robin. You know, that was like the moment when you're like, whoa, you know, this guy looks really hot. <laughs> so I get it. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, and so I, from that moment on, I, sort, I, I knew that I was different, but I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, I was, and I still am. I mean, I, I was involved in tons of sports. Like I, I love sports. I played baseball competitively forever. Uh, I played tennis competitively. Um, and so for me, that was, and, and in this area, when you are perceived to be different, people treat you a different way. Yeah. I mean, I was certainly called names in middle school. I mean, I carried that with me. Um, going into high school, I didn't really have a lot of self-confidence because I, I, I had really big ears as a kid. I always kind of joke that I was like, happy baby new year. <laughs> uh, so I, w- I wore my hair down around my ears because I wasn't proud of my big ears. And, and because of that, like, I mean, I looked pretty feminine. I wore a baseball hat all the time to sort of cover up my long hair. I had the long hair there to protect the ears. I wore the baseball <laughs> cap to protect the long hair. It was exhausting. Yeah. So really, it, it took until high school when I really sort of became comfortable with who I was becoming. Um, and certainly, it, it took going off to college and realizing that I wasn't alone um, to really make me feel comfortable with who I was. Um, it didn't take long after the college experience. In fact, Oddly enough, at Kentucky Wesleyan, there were a handful of people in my fraternity, and we kind of always kid. I was a SIG EP there, and we sort of had this in, this joke that, you know, SIG EP, we take brotherly love to new heights. Uh, because, Do you know my story? That sounds like he knows my story. My first, I don't, but tell it. <laughs> my first boyfriend was actually in my fraternity, so it's, so it's right me there. Me too! Yeah. <laughs> I was a Kappa SIG Yes, so, me yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, and so in in that experience, uh, in fact, it's funny. So that's actually how I ended up telling my parents. Um, And so I had a couple of friends I mentioned, Steve earlier, who became my college boyfriend. He was my fraternity brother boyfriend. Uh, Our friend Sammy, who I'm still great friends with today. In fact, I just saw him in New York City. I love that man. He's so great. But they used to come over to my house because even on campus, like I didn't live on campus. I lived at at home because, you know, why spend the money? (laughs) And so my friends would always come over to the house. Well, I'll never forget one night, Steve and Sammy had been over and they left the house. And um, my mom came downstairs, my bedroom and this huge entertainment, uh, like living room was in the basement. And she came down and she said, Hey, um, do you mind if I ask you a question? And I said, No, not at all. And she said, Well, um, is Sammy homosexual? (laughs) And I said, You think? (laughs) Yeah, he is. And then she said, well, okay, so can I ask you another question? She said, is Steve homosexual too? I said, yes, mother, he is. And then she said, are you? (laughs) And I said, Yes, I am. And and give it to my mom. And, you know, in, in, in the late 80s and early 90s, I understand now looking back that this was sort of an ingrained yeah. parental response. Um, the first thing she said to me, in fact, we talk about this today, th- this, to this day, and she, she's sort of always embarrassed by it, but, but it's part of the story, so I have to say it and I have to own it. She said, do you have AIDS? Like, that's the first thing that yeah, she said. That's normally always the first and thing. And of course, well, you know, and, and 
and in her defense, my mother is so incredibly supportive. And yeah. um, for the folks who were around for the fairness ordinance and the open forums, my mom was a star of that because she got up and talked about how she gave birth proudly to a big gay baby. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I look back on that moment and I don't really fault her for it because I think that anybody in the late, any parent in the late 80s who was raising a gay child was sort of programmed by society at that time to have that preconceived notion yeah. of what being gay is about. Because look, um, in the late 80s, the the HIV, the AIDS, AIDS was just still like just raging through the community. Um, we failed miserably as a country to deal with that the way that we should have. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, I don't, I don't fault my mother for having that be her first reaction because let's be honest, I mean, that's what media was telling her. I mean, for all practical purposes, AIDS in the 80s was billed as the gay plague. And I can't imagine what that was like for them to have this child who makes this confession, you know, I understand why her first reaction was, oh my gosh, like, I mean, is this happening to my kid? Um, and the sad part about that is, is I think that stigma still carries on to this day. Um, you know, my, my upbringing was very supportive. Uh, and I'm really, really glad that my mother and my stepfather were just, I mean, welcoming me and my friends with open arms. It's amazing. Uh, there was never a question after that day, but my husband does not come from that background. Uh, my husband comes from a very evangelical, uh, background, uh, where he was basically raised in what I consider to be like for his elementary school years, a religious cult. Um, you know, being gay was just it was unheard of. It wasn't something that you speak about. Uh, when he told his mother that her reaction wasn't, this is the truth. She vomited. Wow. Um, and so, you know, he carries a lot of that with him to this day. There's, I mean, there's a lot of strain in that relationship. And, you know, I've been on this journey with him for 20 something years and, and, and Kevin won't mind me telling you this. He's very open about it. I mean, but, but Kevin's upbringing and the way that his parents reacted to his telling them that he was gay, it wasn't positive. Right. And he carries a lot of, of, of weight and baggage with that. Uh, and over the course of his life, there have been moments in his life where he's battled really severe depression. Um, and that, that depression has taken, has taken on very physical um, traits. Uh, there have been times in his life when he's lost a lot of weight because of depression. And those same things that like were weighing in my mom's head in the late eighties, you know, have weighed in people that we know and respect to this day. And people will say, Oh, um, I, I saw Kevin, you know, this was a few years back. They would say, he looks really, really thin. You know, is, is he sick? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I know what you mean. Right. I <laughs> know uh, he isn't. But there actually are people in this community who are, and they don't need your attitude about right. it. So you have to sort of like lay people out. And, and, and so those two things go hand in hand. In a small town like this, they're sort of always going to go, go hand in hand. But that's what we have to educate people about, about ourselves and the community and things like that. So it's a never-ending uh, journey and struggle and chore. Yeah, I definitely, I mean, that is the rural experience, I think. And I think you've hit the nail on the head whenever you, you talk about, because even if you've had a positive experience from your family, there are still other family members, there are other community members that are going to say things and <laughs> provoke you and you know believe a certain way that they're never going to change their opinions ever. Uh, and you live in this rural area and you get that pretty consistently. I don't know if you, I mean, whenever the fairness ordinance came on, I would read the comments in the Owensboro Times, and it was almost 60% were always very negative and very uh, anti-LGBTQ, uh, and some of them were incredibly hurtful. I had to turn off the comments, honestly. I got to that point. Yeah. Well, here's a fun fact. So you know that I was really involved in that movement. Um, and so one of the things that we did, um, I actually commissioned uh, somebody locally to be a statistician. And so what I had them do was go back from basically, so it was June, oh gosh, I think it was June of 2019 
when Kevin and I sort of dropped our proverbial bomb on Facebook about what the gay experience is like here in Owensboro and Davis County. And I did that for a reason, because look, in this position, I know pretty much everybody. Uh, and I'm involved in some capacity with a lot of people in town that people would consider to be movers and shakers. Right. And I was really surprised to see people who are friends of mine who are in, elect, in, in positions where they're elected officials who sort of buried their head in, heads in the sand. And I'm like, you know what? I'm so tired of this because, you know, everybody likes to pretend that this is a great place to live. And it is. I'm not saying that it isn't. But it's a better place to live if you fit into a certain mold of humans. Absolutely. And that's white and that's male and that's Christian, mm -hmm. right? If you're outside of that, this isn't the best place for you to live. And so, um, and I told Kevin, I said, look, this is gonna this is gonna be a proverbial bomb. Like this is gonna be this is gonna send shockwaves and it's gonna be very eye-opening to people. And I asked him, I said, look, I can handle this. I want to make sure that you can handle this. Are you okay with doing this? And he said, Yes. And this is the truth about what happened. I hit publish, I closed the laptop. We went outside and landscaped our yard for about three or four hours and didn't pay attention to anything that happened um, uh, that evening. When we came back in from doing the yard work, we flipped open the laptops, turned on the cell phones, and we were like, holy crap. Like, I knew this was going to do what it did, and I'm so glad that people had the response. But you were talking about the negative comments. And look, I'll say this about the folks who are sort of perpetually commenting on Owensboro Times. <laughs> No one cares what you think. <laughs> yeah. And you know why no one cares what you think? Because you don't know anything about any topic in the world. Your life literally is lived in your backyard. And that's perfectly fine if you choose to live that way. But you know what? I don't. My life is, extends far beyond my backyard, and my life is richer because of it. So there's that, number one. <laughs> but Curtis, sorry, every once in a while I'll get on a soapbox. <laughs> um, but I actually commissioned somebody to go through from June of 2019. I had them go through and do an inventory of all the comments on all the stories from any major news source that's local, right? So Owensboro Times, 14 WFYE, uh, FIE, uh, my friends over at Eyewitness News, uh, the Messenger Inquirer. And what we found in doing that survey of comments, support for that ordinance was eight to one in favor. Yeah. Eight to one in favor. And so, and that's, that's for me, the really affirming part about this. And this kind of goes back to like being a gay guy on a country radio station. We have flipped the script. Um, overwhelmingly, there is support for people like us. Um, there's been uh, an increased understanding. Um, you know, when, when, when um, the Supreme Court in, in 2016, you know, affirmed gay marriage, there was already support for gay marriage. Um, they basically affirmed what we knew that was already happening here. There was overwhelming support for it. Um, people understand this. And, and, and look, understand is probably a big word uh, because you really can't understand something that you haven't lived. You can, you can empathize with something that you haven't lived. Um, and so we, we knew that we had overwhelming community support for that ordinance. Uh, that ordinance did not pass. Um, it, you know, it stalled at two to two. There were two pros, two cons. But that failed vote does not reflect how the community felt about this. The community was in favor of it. Uh, and, and to me, that makes that effort worth the while because I know that, that creating awareness and really opening people's eyes to what it is like to be gay and live in a place uh, like, like in Western Kentucky, I think it opened a lot of eyes. And for me, and actually those forums – and, you know, we had people at those forums stand up and spew their bastardized version of Christi Christianity. I knew that was going to happen. Right. But for me, seeing people like my husband, he was one of them, who stood at the podium and for the first time ever, I'm going to get emotional. It's fine. Take your time. I, I know this is the tough stuff to talk about on the show. So, Well, the girl, I can't cry and talk at the same <laughs> time. Fine. So, um, but for the first time ever, 
own who they were and be proud of it and stand up and defend it and say, this is who I am and I'm not changing for you no, what, what, no matter what kind of nonsense spews out of your mouth, this is who I am and I'm proud of it. To see so many people stand up and be able to claim that is, is for me the greatest thing ever that could have come out of that entire ordeal. And I'm so proud of it. Yeah. I think one thing I want to say on this, because I was just moving into Owensboro uh, around that time. Um, and I remember the fairness ordinance being talked about and stuff. But for instance, the things that people don't see from those meetings are people like me, uh, because I did not attend that meeting. And the reason I didn't attend was because I was just coming back to Owensboro I still reminisced on every bad thing that had ever happened to me and all the negative that had ever happened to me. Uh, and I had just gotten a new job and, and stuff like that. And I was terrified to speak out because here I am coming back to an environment which I already know doesn't support me as a gay man. And then there's all this advocacy going around this. For me, as bad as it is in that moment, I kind of shielded myself because that's what we do. We start protecting ourselves as gay individuals rather than a lot of times going as a whole to, to fight these initiatives in, the, in rural areas. Today, I wouldn't do that. I'm obviously a very outspoken <laughs> advocate today. I, I, I'm a, on a talk show about gay things all the time. So <laughs> everyone knows at this point where I stand. Uh, but at that moment in my life, that's where I was. And so if there was me, you know there were countless other individuals that are just like me that were terrified to speak up because we're either moving back into communities that we felt hated us, yeah. um, or we were, I mean, we're all dealing with our own individual things there. So, you know, I think the numbers, like you said, the numbers that the statistics that you show are much more reliable than the people that showed up to that meeting, you know? Yes. Well, and, and think about those meetings. The, the number of speakers um, who were pro non-discrimination ordinance far outweighed the negatives at each forum. I mean, there was just overwhelming support, and that and that's the great takeaway from that effort. And of course, since that time, you know, the Supreme Court uh, dug into the 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 definition of the word sex as it relates to the 1964 Civil Rights Law. You know, just recently they had three cases that they reviewed um, that were about issues of discrimination in employment based on folks being LGBTQ. Of course, the argument was, well, this actually pertains to the definition of sex as prescribed by 1964 Civil Rights Law. And you know, now, because of that Supreme Court ruling, it's actually illegal across the United States to discriminate somebody in terms of employment based on um, the fact that they identify as LGBTQ. So a huge win. Now, obviously, in places like like here in Kentucky, where uh, we don't have issues with housing cemented in law, you know, you still can be discriminated, excuse me, discriminated against in terms of housing. But I would imagine that eventually there's going to be some some case where somebody is, they'll take that to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, based on its own precedent, will have to do, I mean, they'll have to go ahead and affirm that it's actually illegal to discriminate in terms of housing, too. So that's coming down the pike. It, it will happen eventually. Um, the, the sad thing is, is that we actually do have people in this community um, who do still actively discriminate against gays and lesbians uh, in terms of housing. And the bad thing is they can get away yeah, with it. Right now they can totally get away with it. But the day is coming where they won't be able to. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And um, but again, and, and real quick to your point about, you know, not speaking up at that at that ordinance, you know, um, a lot of folks were in that boat. Um for me, and I and, and I'm I would never be in a position ever where I out somebody, but I will tell you this. Um, I've lived here a long time. I have lots of friends, and I have friends who are married men who are gay. And they're in those relationships because they were brought up here and they were conditioned to believe that they have to live life a certain way. And the problem with that is, is that they live, they're living lives that are lies. Yeah. Um, I hate that for them. Um, and and I, I can't imagine what it's like to have to sort of shelve that side of you and just literally tuck it away in the closet. I mean, there's a reason we say coming out of the closet, right? But they tuck that away um, and they, they can't 
be who they truly are. Uh, and for me, that breaks my heart. Um, and, and, and I love those people. And I just hope that someday they'll find an environment where they can own it and they can be proud of it and they can claim it like the rest of yeah. us have. And see, those are the ones you know. See, I, I don't know how uh, social apps were back in the day when you met Kevin, but social apps today where you can actually meet up with people and talk to people. I mean, if you come to a rural area, it's all blank profiles and then you learn all about well this person's married this person's you know in a committed relationship (laughs) with a female for 13 years you know like and so it's it's even there it becomes this like secretive environment and you know i i agree i hope that one day that they're able to you know break out of that shell and wouldn't it wouldn't it do wonders for acceptance though if if those people could really come out of the shadows and really proclaim it I, I think that, again, the people in the community who would be surprised by it would be like, oh, my gosh, you really? And and, and what what great leaps and bounds that would do for just awareness Absolutely. if 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 we if we had that sort of open door policy where people could be accepted for who they are um, and not feel just chained by the expectations of yeah. other people. It's 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 insanity. It's the, it's the famous but, um, uh, Harvey Milk line, you know. If they know one of us, they're more likely to accept all of us, you know. So you that's know, exactly that's right. The key, and I, it, so many families, especially in this area, if they only know one, it seems like around here they've got to know at least four to accept all of us, you know. So it's it's a numbers <laughs> yeah. game here. And I'll be honest, you know, when I first started on my radio show, like I internally struggled with how much to share about my life. Um, and it took, it took a few years to get to the point where I was comfortable because I, I knew that, okay, look, I, I knew that I had friends in the listening audience and I knew that people liked me and I liked them, but I knew that I would have to sort of impart that in a strategic way. Like I would have to, I would have to get, let them get to know me and then get to know those aspects of me. And it took time. I mean, I'm not going to say that I went on the air on day one and was like, hey, you know, I'm here and I'm completely gay and I have a boyfriend and we have multiple rescue dogs and like, this is how I roll. Um, You know, it it, it took a lot of time for me to build that trust with them. Um, And really that trust worked both ways, right? I mean, I wanted them to trust me and I also also needed to trust them that once that I was finally open about this, that the relationship didn't dissolve. And I think a prime example of how it did not, and I love this story. And I didn't get to hear this. This was relayed to me by my friend, Sarah Jackson. Um, So the very first year that Joey Chestnut came to Owensboro to compete in the World Mutton Slider (laughs) Eating Championship at the Barbecue Festival, because that's amazing, Mm -hmm. um, I was invited to compete alongside him. So if you've ever been to one of those professional eating championships, there's a lot of pomp and circumstance, right? And so there are all these introductions going on. Well, I was introduced on the stage, you know, before Joey, because clearly he's going to get top billing (laughs) because the man can eat like a machine. It's crazy. And my friend Sarah was in the audience and she was watching. Well, they were making the introduction about me. She told me this afterwards. And there were a couple of guys that, that people would probably label rednecks. And I hate that label, by the way, because I think that the label redneck is just a disser- as a disservice to them as using a derogatory term to us would be. And so, uh, but there were a couple of guys who were talking and they were like, hey, and my friend Sarah overheard this whole thing. They were like, you know, he's married to a man. Did you know that? And uh, one of the other guys said, you know what? I heard that. But she said that as soon as they said my name and introduced me on the stage, they were like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> so, great. Like, <laughs> so like, you know, I mean, we've, we've made a lot of yeah. progress and, and I love my listening audience and it's, it's just a pleasure to get to be with them every single morning and let them share their lives with me. And we share their lives on the air too. Uh, and that I get to share my life with them. I mean, it really is. It's a, it's, it's an honor and it's a privilege. Yeah. That's great. I, I commend you for what you do, and I, and I love the fact that you get to do a lot of that as a radio talk show host. Whenever I, I whenever I came back, I came back, and my job was an attorney. So like I was super like, like <laughs> what can I say? What can I not say here? You know. So and I'm still to that point. You know, in the attorney profession, we can't, we still can't be vocal about a lot of things. You know, so uh, it's difficult. But I want to get into the latter part of the non discrimination ordinance. I know that that there were several people that spoke up. Uh, kind of tell the Owensboro listeners where that ended. 
uh, and, and kind of walk us through that process. Yeah. So it ended, it stalled. Uh, so it did not get passed and you know, oh, and I, and I'll be honest, it kind of drives me crazy that that ordinance died in the middle of COVID because when the fiscal court called their vote, the fiscal court meetings were closed to the public because of right. COVID. So everybody sort of had to tune in and watch what was a, a very impassioned movement basically die in silence. And so that's probably the biggest regret that I have about that. Um, you know, so uh, at the time we had two county commissioners, of course, Judge Executive Al Mattingly um, and Mike Coger, who voted affirmatively. And we had Charlie Castlin uh, and George Wathen who voted negatively. Um, and so because of the 2-2 two -two split, it stalled. Uh, and it's been stalled since. Like I said, the Supreme Court did us a favor on the employment front. Um, it is still an issue uh, in terms of housing and public accommodations. Um, it's no secret that we have people in this community who actively discriminate, and they just make no bones yeah. about it. In fact, they got up at the Fairness Ordinance forums and told you they were going to do it. Um, I think it's repugnant. Um, I think it is absolutely the antithesis of community. Um, there are a lot of talking points around that. In fact, you know, we're going through an election cycle here uh, that, of course, in this area, it's a predominantly a Republican primary. If you vote Democrat, I mean, you go into the voting booth and you have like four boxes <laughs> yeah. to check. I mean, if you go into the Republican, you have like this many boxes to check. Um and so, you know, it became a talking point even in some of the forums this time uh, where people would be asked about it. And I love that, that one of the go-tos is, well, um, you know, uh, my thoughts about that are, I have a question. So how do you police that? Okay, so let me just cut through the crap. Um, that is actually a talking point that is, to, that is put into place to mask bigotry. Because you wouldn't ask that question if we were having this conversation in reference to African Americans. You wouldn't ask that question if this were asked in reference to women, right. which let's be honest, women are, not, women are not a minority in population, but women are a minority when it comes to elected yeah. office because they're grossly outnumbered by men. And look at our local ballot. You don't see a lot of females running for public office on our local ballot. I think that too is um, a it is still issue with even the women in our area sure. and the biblical influence that uh, that that has had. So. Sure. Oh, there's no doubt about it. In fact, I mean, I, I, I've said this to a lot of people, and I think this is the truth. You know, there's a lot of talk about the 2016 presidential election, um, and and say what you want about either candidate, but you know, people say. Donald Trump beat Hillary Clinton. Actually, no, he didn't. Other women beat Hillary Clinton. That's how Hillary Clinton lost the election. I mean, that's the truth. Because exactly what you said. I mean, there are women in this community and in other communities who feel like they're biblically ordained to not be vocal and to stay at home and not take ownership of what they feel and how they think. Uh, they don't think they should speak. Uh, and, and for me, I feel like all minorities are sort of sort of rowing the same boat, even though we all come from different backgrounds, right? And that's true of African Americans in this community. It's true of Latin Americans. So let's be honest. Um, you know, I talked about moving back from California. And again, that was only going to be temporary. But when I was in Southern California, I had, a, I had a lot of Latin American friends. And the thought of coming back here where I wasn't going to have that infusion of culture, it drove me crazy. Um, I told this story when, um, when I spoke at the very first uh, non-discrimination ordinance forum, I remember I was in a super eight, it was tragic, in, uh, in Colorado, and it was pouring. And uh, my friend Amy had flown out to drive back with me. And I called my parents from a pay phone. This dates this a little <laughs> bit. There was a pay phone outside of the super eight. I called them collect. And I was, I was dying inside. Diet. I had two more days left of that trip, and I did not want to come back to Kentucky because I had just gotten so used to other cultures and other ways of thinking and being around people who weren't the same. I mean, for God's sake, I mean, I worked at a Jewish community center. 
I wasn't Jewish. It was amazing. It was one of the best times of my life. I had tons of Latin American friends. I had gay friends. I had black friends. And the thought of coming back to Owensboro, which at the time was just so homogenized, it was torture. And I remember being in that, in that phone booth and the rain was pouring down. And my, my best friend in the world, Amy, was in taking a shower. She had no idea that her best friend was out having a mental meltdown in the parking lot. And I remember my mom asking me, she said, Chad, what's so bad about coming back home? And I said to them on speakerphone, so she and my stepdad could hear it. I said, I don't want to come back to Owensboro where everybody is the same. Yeah. That's just how I felt. Um, and so I think that anybody who's in a minority community feels that way to some degree, yeah. right? And so when I say that we're all rowing the same boat, I mean it. That's why it's so important for all of us to come together and find that shared desire to have a voice. Because if you, you talk in terms of like the LGBTQ community, you know, there are all kinds of estimates about what that population is. And look, let's be honest, it's a continuum. Right. Uh, it's a scale. And, and, it's, and it's huge. People will be surprised to know that that, that percentage probably falls between like 3% and 10%. And I don't think saying 10% is like an exaggeration. That's probably the case if you measure They've, into actually the Actually, the uh, stats guesstimated it even higher recently um, at nearly 20% with the coming generation. So, Yeah, I believe that. Um, and, 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 I'll, and I'll say this, and, and I, I hope there are young people listening to this show, because, look, I mean, gosh, would it be amazing to be a gay kid oh now? Gosh. <laughs> you Have know? you seen Heartstoppers yet wouldn't it be- on Netflix? Have you seen Heartstoppers? Oh well, I have not. You got to watch it. Like that's it. It just makes me want to be a teenager and like actually have those like things happen yeah. to me, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> it would be so great to be a gay kid now, but I, but I will tell you, and I firmly believe this, what, what the young LGBTQ generation needs to understand is that there are way bigger issues that they need to tackle than the small issues that they, they focus on sometimes. And it's not discounting them, okay? Like, I'm, I'm not doing that, so please understand that. But look, I'm much less concerned what pronoun my grandparents use than I am about what I consider to be a radicalized movement in this country that centers, that centers around Christian fundamentalism yeah. that threatens to take away rights that we've worked our asses off to get. Um, and that is happening. And that's happening for a lot of minorities, not just the LGBTQ community. It's happening for women. Oh, We're yeah. seeing it in the last month. Um, we have to get that very impassioned and very free thinking base of our youngsters to galvanize around these much broader issues um, because it, it is it is literally a battle to maintain rights. Um, and it's, a, it, I think it's going to be a real battle and we need all hands on deck. Let's talk a little bit about that. So we are in Owensboro, Kentucky, um, and we've had a lot of gay bars come and go and fail. And, uh, as far as I know, there's not one currently really in town. Um, there's, uh, there's like one church that's gay supportive that hosts a few events here and there for, uh, youth. Uh, but there's really not a lot of events. There's not a lot of places to congregate for even adult gay uh, individuals in this town. Uh, we don't know each other. I mean, we know of each other. We know, you know, that sort of thing. But we don't really know each other. There's a lot of us that have never met. Uh, this is the first time we've met, you know. So, so Yeah, it's crazy, so but you're that, right. How do we, I guess, frame those messages and stuff whenever we don't even meet ourselves, if that makes sense? No, it does make sense. And it's a really, really good question. In fact, you know, uh, well, here's, here's, here's another example. So, you know, we're coming up on Pride Month here in Owensboro. And, and I'll be honest, I've never attended a local Pride event. I've never done it. And it's, it's not because I haven't wanted to. Um, I just have never felt compelled to do it. And that's probably a big shame on me. Um, conversely, uh, you know, I'm on the board of a, of a charity that has brought to town drag bingo, which, uh, last year sold out. And, you know, and I think, I think that's a pretty good sign too. Uh, you know, 
we talked about doing drag bingo for a while uh, and last year's event sold out there was a waiting list for tickets um this year it's coming up june 11th by the way shameless plug uh, at the owensboro convention center um but we we really expanded that event this year. We're bringing in more drag queens. Um, we're actually announcing this. You'll get a little sneak preview. Uh, coming up in a week, we're going to announce the names of three uh, male community members who are pretty well known, who have agreed to fundraise for the charity, which is New Beginnings. By the way, New Beginnings, uh, we coordinate uh, free therapeutic services for victims of child sexual abuse um, and rape and, and sexual assault. Um, people would be astounded if they knew what our client numbers were uh, they would be astounded to know the socioeconomic levels that abuse um, crosses here it's yeah. it's mind-blowing uh, it is a real problem uh, but so we have three men from the community who have agreed to fundraise for us the person who raises the most money is going to get a professional drag makeover at Ooh. the event um, and that's happening. So, uh, and by the way, the event sold out in two days this year. Um, despite the fact that we had one county commissioner who I won't name, but he knows who he is, who from Davis County Fiscal Courts, uh, his, his public email address is taxpayer funded, sent an email to uh, various members of the charity to tell them that they have forever embarrassed uh, the community of Owensboro and Davis wow. County. Well, um, I will say to that, sold out in two yeah. days. And we're filling the bottom of the convention center. So I think the embarrassment is actually you. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so, you know, I, I don't know what the answer to that question is. And it's, and it really, there are so many layers here, right? Because, you know, as, as vocal as I am, I probably don't do a really good job, um, at going out and, 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 and seeing other folks in the community. Um, I will be speaking later on this week at a diversity um, forum for leadership in Winsboro. You know, I try to do those those types of things. But you're right in terms of like building a really strong knit community. We're not very good at it. And I don't know how we get yeah. better at well, it. Well, I think a lot of us and you can speak to your experience, but a lot of us, we do a lot of traveling. We go to environments that we are we know we're accepted in. Uh, back to our friends in Louisville or, you know, California or New York or those kind of places. Yeah. And I don't, I think what happens is, is we, those of us that have come back to rural areas, we work here, but we go play somewhere else. And so a lot of times we don't even take the time to meet other LGBTQ people in our area because we never, it's like we never actually want to stay. Like, we don't want to get connected. We don't want to get <laughs> too involved because we want to be able to go if we want to. Um, so I don't know if that's your experience or if you've talked to other LGBTQ people who have felt that way. It's completely my experience. In fact, my friends will tell you, um, I travel a lot. And I get asked by my friends why I travel so much. And, and honestly, I'm on it. I, I say, look. I need to get out of here. Like I need to go, I need to go have some culture outside of this town. Um, I need to be around brown people. I need to be around African Americans. I need to be around other gay people. Like I need to go out and, and explore. Now I'll be honest. I have gone to places in the world where you can't be LGBTQ. Yeah. Um, in fact, Kevin and I last um, summer, we went to Kenya where being homosexual is a crime. Um, you can be in prison for it. In fact, um, I made a friend there, um, and we, we stay in touch and I could tell when I met him, I'm like, this, this, this is a gay man. Uh, but this is a gay man who is trapped in a country where he'll, I mean, he's, he said, in fact, he's, he's talked about like how open and, 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 and sort of my activism. And he said, if you were in Kenya, you'd be killed. Yeah. Like plain and simple. In fact, uh, right before we left for Kenya last year, Kevin uh, got a new tattoo on his on his forearm. Um, he got the Black Lives Matter uh, banner and he got the uh, the rainbow flag tattooed. Um, and he was very cognizant in in Kenya and and determined yeah. to cover that up so Rip, nobody would yeah. see it. Um, and it's kind of an interesting dynamic to be in because you know here in the United States we have we have fought for and earned a lot of rights. Uh, we're not fully there yet, um, but we're getting there. But in other parts of the world, uh, there's just absolutely no such thing as rights for gay folks. Um, and it's a pretty interesting experience to be in that, 
in that environment um, where people look at you like I can't tell you how many times that Kevin and I were asked if we're brothers. Right. <laughs> and our answer was, OK. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever sure. You, yeah. We're brothers. I get it. What, whatever you need to tell yourself, that's 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 exactly what we are. So it's it's really interesting to be in that kind of environment because you see how far we've come oh, yeah. here in the states, and 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 a lot of times, you know, a lot of times, and I think this is certainly true of of of, of the younger generation coming up because they haven't had those experiences. It sort of gets taken for granted, but I can tell you, it's not something that we can ever take for granted. We have to we have to appreciate it, we have to celebrate it. And we have to continue Absolutely. to fight for it. Uh, I do want to talk before we get into some of these like specific segments. I do want to talk about you and Kevin. Uh, tell us a little bit about where y'all met and yeah. marriage and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah. So we actually met um, through my sister. Um, she and and I had heard of Kevin before I moved back from. California, because uh, my sister actually called me when I was in California. She was telling me the story about this friend of hers who had just come out to his parents, and she told me the story about you know his mom vomiting and and uh, the fact that the family didn't deal very well with it and stuff like that. So when I came back, I knew who Kevin was, and so um, yeah, so we actually spent a bunch of time together, and um, just things evolved, and uh, that was twenty something years ago. We've been together a long time. Um, so it's it's funny. I mentioned the New York story earlier about me like re, like applying and then reapplying to NYU. So I can't tell you in this in this profession that I have when people find out that I was going to go to NYU to study broadcast journalism, I get asked a lot. Do you regret not going to New York? Like, do you should you have gone to New York or gosh, you know, you would be doing so great in like New York City or something like that. And people say that in front of Kevin. And people historically said that in front of him and just never, ever thought that for him, the possibility of me going away would have like it would have completely altered the course of our relationship and our lives yeah. together. Right. And so um, I decided after the Supreme Court, you know, affirmed gay marriage, I decided that I was going. We had, we, we had gotten into the habit of going to New York a lot. And so I decided that I was going to propose to him in New York City. Because for so so many years of our relationship, New York was always this thing out here that was like the symbol of where Chad should be as opposed to being in Owensboro with Kevin for a lot of people. And so what I decided to do was to propose to him in New York. So then New York was a part of our story together. And so uh, I proposed in 2016. And then in 2017, um, we didn't tell a soul. Um, we eloped. Uh, the only person who knew we were going to New York to get married was my mom. Um, our dog sitter didn't even know we were going to New York to get married. And so we went off to New York. It was freezing ass cold. Um, I think it was 29 degrees the morning that we got married in Central Park. And um, we ended up getting snowed in uh, by a blizzard. So we ended up sp spending two extra days there. And so he and I went to um, like a little food coffee shop thing. And I got my laptop out. We had gotten the photographs from the professional photographer we hired to be our wedding photographer and our witness. <laughs> and uh, we put together this wedding video. And uh, at three o'clock in the afternoon on, I think it was March 17th, we, we broke the news. Maybe, maybe it was the 15th. I'm not sure. But we got married on the 13th. Um, at three o'clock in the afternoon in the lobby of the Belvedere Hotel in Hell's Kitchen, we hit publish, and that's how we told everybody that we got married. Um, so that's how we did it. So New York now is a big part of our story. So we go back every March uh, for our anniversary, and we spend a lot of time there. And well, that's, that's what great. We do. And so actually, we were we were there this past March, and uh, for our anniversary, um, we ended up going to the very first restaurant that we ate together during our very first trip to New York back in the summer of 1998. Uh, we ended up in a restaurant called Paisano's. So this year, I surprised Kevin, and we went to Paisano's to have our anniversary Aww. dinner there. So he's a romantic, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody. <laughs> he's got that romantic in him. <laughs> yeah, so we have we have dogs. We have rescues. Uh, we have three right now. We have uh, Ellie, who's been with us the longest. She's a rescued Bashan Frise. She came to us from Virginia. Uh, we have Yogi, who's also a rescued Bashan Frise. And then uh, we have Simon, 
who is uh, a Karen Terrier. And Simon and Yogi both were uh, rescued uh, by Sparky. And I do a lot of work with Sparky at Saving Paws Animal Rescue of Kentucky. Um, I'm a huge advocate for them. Um, I have them on my show every week with the Sparky Pet of the Week. And um, Simon and Yogi that's are from great. that program. So you've got three rescues. Uh, that's quite the family. It's, that sounds way too busy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And I do want to also compliment you. I saw I, we've been seeing some flashes of this tattoo, and I think that that's something we need to bring up. So these yes. are this is tattoos, and it's uh, commemorative to St. Jude's uh, that I know you've raised over two million dollars yeah. for uh, over over time. Can you yeah. tell us about your involvement there? Yeah. So um. So. My radio station, WBKR, is part of the Country Cares Network. So Country Cares was started 30-ish years ago by Randy Owen, who was the front man of Alabama. Uh, he had gone to visit St. Jude and um, was in some discussions about the the sort of endless fundraising that is done on behalf of St. Jude. And Randy Owen, knowing country music fans, he said, you know what? I know country fans and they'll get behind this. Uh, they will support this cause and they will donate to it. And then thus was born the Country Cares Network. In fact, fun story, the very first Country Cares radio station was KSON, which just happens to be in San Diego, California. Um, but so our station became a St. Jude Country Cares station, I think in 2003 or four, one of those two. I don't remember the exact year. Um, my real involvement started probably 2007, 2000. 2008, um, I went to the Country Cares Conference. In fact, this young lady, you can't see it because I'm, my, well, maybe, well, well, I don't know, maybe somewhere in here. My arm says saints and angels up in here. So um, I was at a breakfast in Memphis, and there was a man who talked with a thick Mississippi drawl, and he got up and he spoke about his daughter. Ellen Taylor was her name. <clears throat> And um, he spoke about this young lady and how vibrant she was and how St. Jude had, had saved her life. And then um, after speaking for a little bit, he said, I would like to introduce you to my daughter. And he said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is Ellen Taylor. And this young lady, she was four at the time. We couldn't see her because it was a, a flat room, so there were no levels. Uh, but so we all kind of stood up trying to get a glimpse of this young lady who had been sitting in the front. And uh, all of a sudden, I saw this little bald head, you know, walking across uh, across the convention center room, and she got up on stage, and then everybody could see her. And uh, and uh, she she said, "Hello, I'm Ellen Taylor, and you know, St. Jude saved my life." And then she she had a microphone, and she said, um, "Can I sing for you?" And uh, so she started to sing. She sang a cappella. She sang. Um, She sang Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And. Wow. That moment changed my adult life forever. Um, I'd been I'd been going to St. Jude like I'd been a supporter. I knew what the hospital did. Um, but until I had that experience of watching that exuberant child stand up after going through things that let's be honest, most, most adults couldn't imagine. And to stand there so proudly without any hair at all and sing for a room of adults she had never met and just belt out that song like she was on a Broadway stage. It just- That's amazing, yeah. I couldn't breathe, I couldn't breathe. And, um, and, uh, and, and she, she really inspired my like personal St. Jude journey. Um, she's, she and now a lot of, a lot of other patients are why I'm so passionate about the hospital and why I will always be a champion of theirs. Um, because I've seen the miracles that that hospital can create. She's one of them. Um, there are others who are on my arm. Uh, there are other people on my arm who, who couldn't beat cancer. Uh, but that I had the pleasure of getting to know and hearing their stories. And I mentioned, you know, I, I write country music. Um, when Jacqueline Graves, uh, my dear friend, when she and I were on the station together, we started creating original St. Jude songs 
inspired by patients. And we would go into the recording studio wow. every year and write and record a new song that was based on a St. Jude patient and their journey. And we would share that with our listeners and we would make those the anthems of our radio thons. And all those kids are on my arm. This young lady right here that says dreamer. Um, that's for my dear friend, Ella dreamer, who, when she was, uh, seven or eight years old, she got diagnosed with, um, this just incredibly rare form of cancer, adrenal cortical carcinoma. It's a mouthful. Um, she went through chemotherapy. She was cancer free. Moments later, it recurred. When that cancer recurs, your chance of um, living are minimal. Um, that young lady is a wow. teenager now. <laughs> she's, she's driving. It's I mean, wow. she's a, she's a miracle of modern medicine. Um, and I always say that I sort of wear my heart on my sleeve, but in terms of St. Jude, which by the way, the symbols up here, I say, I wear my, I wear my heart as a sleeve. Um, so this arm is a total dedication to that hospital and what they do for kids around the world. That's incredible. What an amazing impact just in those people's lives and for St. Jude's as a whole. That's incredible what you've done. So, so we do a segment on this show called the Heap of Trouble segment. Uh, and what that is, we want to know your wildest LGBTQ related story. Uh, it can be uh, a time you slipped up in the culture or just some amazing wild experience that you've had because you're a gay man. There, there, I've got some good ones. but uh, So I decided to share this because this is freaking hilarious. And this goes back to my life on campus at Kentucky Wesleyan College. And I think that people will think this is really funny because it is. So I mentioned my friends earlier, my friends Steve and Sammy, right? So, and again, being in a fraternity, I was in Sigma Phi Epsilon, and we had, there were, there were a variety of, of, of gay guys in that fraternity. But, you know, of course, on a small campus, not everybody's open about it. So, but the three of us were. Well, we sort of always used to tease Sammy because Sammy, by the way, has a drag alter ego. Her name is Patty Melt. And Patty Melt is fabulous. Now, I never got the opportunity to meet Patty Melt when we were in college. She was only a legend at the time. Like, we didn't get to see her in all of her glory. Uh, but we knew about her. And we sort of always used to kid, <laughs> we used to always kid Sammy that, because, you know, when you're in college, you learn about all these different like theories and, and I, ideas and ideals. And uh, we, we had talked about penis envy in one of our classes. Well, we talked about the fact that Sammy had vagina envy. <laughs> so, so I swear to you, this is what we did. This is so embarrassing. I can't believe I'm sharing this on this forum. But if, they, if, he, if you were at Wesley, you know this happened. So anyway, it had to have been around Easter because we decided that we were going to create for Sammy. And some of my straight friends were involved in this, by the way. Um, and they know who they are, Lori. Um, <laughs> but we decided to create for Sammy because he had vagina envy, a vagina care package. <laughs> okay. Oh my gosh. So is this too much? Because I can no. stop. I want to know okay. what's in this package. Let's go. <laughs> this, this is, I can't believe I'm sharing this. Okay. Anyway, it's called Heap of Trouble. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> so like I said, it must have been around Easter because we decided to stage this vagina care package as a basket. And so we got this very beautiful woven basket. And so what we did is we decided to decorate it. So we, first of all, so a bunch of my friends, we went to Walmart and we raided the female hygiene product, the, 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 the aisles, right? So the first thing that we did to the basket is we got um, panty liners and we lined the interior of the basket completely because we wanted to put stuff down in it. And because it was wicker, we didn't want anything falling out of it. <laughs> so then... God. So then we had we had purchased um, a box of of Massengill because you know it, ca it came in this like direct like this like um, decorative box and on the on the front of it was this woman and she was holding a flower. Oh. <laughs> so we had this great picture of Sammy where he was standing and I think he was like holding maybe like, um, I don't know, uh, maybe like a red solo cut from a toga party that we had the fraternity or something like that. But we got this picture and we cut it out and we superimposed Sammy's picture over the picture of the woman <laughs> holding the flower. And so he was actually on the cover of the douche box. So we put that in the basket. 
Wow. Then, <laughs> oh, this is so bad. Is and Sammy so then, gonna, is Sammy going to hear this, this this show? Is he going to get uh, mad at you for telling the story? <laughs> no, Sammy loved this. By the way, this this was probably the greatest gift he's ever received in his life. So then, uh, we bought a bunch of tampons, and so <clears throat> we sat in Steve's dorm room with, like I said, with a variety of friends, Lori, and uh, we decided we were going to color them. So we we had these like um, fluorescent Crayola markers. And we took each tampon and we colored it with the, the markers and then we dipped them into water so they would like, you know, expand and swell. And then we shaped them into flowers. And then I swear to you, in the microwave in the dorm room, we baked them dry so they would <laughs> keep their shape as flowers. So we made this gigantic tampon flower bouquet and we positioned it in the front of the basket. <laughs> and I'm not done. So then we got some sort of like, I don't know, some sort of powder and we sprinkled the powder like it was very scented. It was like uh, it was, I don't know, it was out of the hygiene aisle and we dusted all the flowers with this powder. So it would smell really, really nice, like a fresh bouquet of flowers. We had the Massengill box with Sammy's <laughs> face on it. And so we surprised him at Easter with his vagina care package. <laughs> I want you to know that the man cried because he was so appreciative. He said, this is the best gift I've ever gotten ever. And he paraded it around our entire floor of our fraternity and showed everybody. That is awesome. I love that story. <laughs> that's that's it. That's becoming a new I, thing. Like we're going to have to, me and Leah is going to have a vagina care package like... Like they like they do bake offs. We're gonna have our own like competition here. Who can make the best vagina care package? Now that's that's genius. So I love it. Uh, we do a segment called the Pot of Gold. So we want to definitely give our fans uh, the Pot of Gold segment for this episode. Uh, that's a chance yes. for you to ask me anything under the sun that you want to ask. Okay, so so just so you all know, if you're if you're tuning in, uh, we actually recorded this on uh, the 16th of May, which happens to be honor our LGBT Elders Day. And so I'm curious. This is what I want to ask you. So growing up uh, in rural USA, if you're going to honor one of your LGBT elders, who do you point to? Who? Who did you look up to? Who did you look at that made you say, okay, wait a minute. I think I may be this. I think I'm like this person. Who was that for you? That's a great question. Because honestly, as coming from a rural area, and I, like I grew up super religious. So, you know, like the word gay, I didn't hear it until college, you know? So like it was a new experience for me. I always knew that I was a little different, but I really didn't have anybody to point to, uh, I'd heard of gay people, but I really didn't know any. And that's the honest truth up until I was probably 19, 20 years old. I would never met a gay person. Uh, yeah. I'm sure I did, but I didn't know that they were, you know? So, uh, yeah. but I would say in terms of elder gays that I truly look up to today, uh, Greg Burke is obviously going to be a huge one for me. Um, he was a former guest on, uh, who was actually went all the way to the Supreme Court to uh, help with the gay marriage ruling. Um, mm. so he was a huge one for me and he, uh, he went to U of L, so he's from our, uh, alma mater. Um, and his story's incredible. Um, he's been a, a mentor to me when it comes to that. I'd say in terms of rural areas, uh, you know, I grew up in the church, but something that a lot of people that probably aren't from rural areas don't know is most of your pianist and organist in your churches, a lot of times... They're gay <laughs> men that that are still in incredibly involved in their churches. Um, and so like a lot of them uh, that I've been able to reach back out to and, and kind of understand their life a little more now, um, I'd say that's a, that's a whole section of like our community that we uh, that was hidden for so long. We're everywhere. Well, folks, that's all the time we have for today. Don't forget to come on back now. I know we all love a little vibration, so if you are not already, go ahead and subscribe to this podcast. And we will surprise you on occasion with a new release vibration in your pocket. But in the meantime, if you find yourself alone or crossing new horizons along the rainbow trail and you need a friend or even a laugh to get you through those dark and stormy nights, holler on out to us 
at www.weatheringrainbows.com where you can find shelter in the blogs, videos, and other episodes that will hopefully keep you out of a whole heap of trouble. So until next time, y'all, giddy up, be true to yourself, and make the best of life. And wherever the wild tracks may lead you, may the rainbow always touch your shoulder.